Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Douglas Smith, who is the Robert A. Groff Professor of Neurosurgery here at the School of Medicine and the director of the Penn Center for Brain Injury and Repair. Uh, Dr. Smith has devoted his full-time efforts to the study of neurotrauma following completion of fellowships both in molecular biology and neural trauma at the University of Connecticut. His research interests have included mechanisms of nerve trauma and repair, uh, magnetic, magnetic resonance techniques for the diagnosis of diffuse axonal injury, uh, traumatic brain injury and cognitive, cognitive dysfunction, and the link between brain trauma and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Uh, Dr. Smith's research efforts have resulted in over 160 publications, and his work and expertise have been featured in a variety of popular media sources, such as uh, the Scientific American Magazine and the documentary Head Game. Give a warm welcome to Dr. Doug Smith. Well, it's really great to be here. Um, and I want to talk about a device that's really unique that we want to emulate if you think about brain machine interfacing. I don't know if everybody can see that, but this is really just a toy. The device I want to address is this thing, because that really should be the goal. And I'm worried that you know sometimes some of these efforts that are you see that are spectacular to help people who might be locked in um, may sh fall short of getting to the hand, or the human hand. So. Um, is there a clicker or something? Yeah, it's not going down. Okay, so there's, I have a, a disclaimer or disclosure that uh, some of the technology I'll talk about has been licensed by Penn to a startup company. And uh, to begin with, um, have you ever wondered, I mean, when the iconic scene from Star Wars occurs, uh, there's a pinprick on this hand, it moves after Luke has his arm cut off, and that means that a signal from this prosthetic has gone to his brain and a signal back that his hand twitches. And I'm really curious about what this thing is because <laughs> what's going on there? I mean, can you poke something hard into the nervous system and it'll like it? Your nervous, your nervous system did not evolve to get hard, sharp things jammed into it. it it's evolved to um, accept something wet, kind of familiar, and it should be nervous tissue. And I think we're at a crossroads right now that's akin to the when uh, over 100 years ago, people were trying to decide, or really there's a huge debate, about how to bring electricity to our homes. And now we have to decide how to bring electric currents from our body to drive devices and how devices can communicate with our nervous system. But the state of the art is not really great. This is actually the most widely used multi-electrode array. It's put into the motor cortex and then you have neurons there that have to learn how to kind of uh, spike to get these different regions to record from them. Now, the problem is that your motor cortex doesn't actually run anything. It just tells other people what to do. Um, so this is limited. It's great, like, if someone has very severe ALS or um, very uh, is paralyzed, a quadriplegic, but the movements are somewhat gross. And, uh, you know, you might be able to move a cursor on a screen even, or move a limb that looks real, but it cannot pick up a dime. To pick up a dime, there is a lot going on. For every nerve, large nerve in your arm, you have about a million nerve fibers or axons that will direct that movement. And it's not just moving the motor component, the, the muscles, it's actually getting the sensory feedback. And those two together combine to form proprioception. Without proprioception, you cannot button your shirt. You cannot catch a ball. You have to look at a hand and just say, okay, hand, move this way or that way, and it could be very uh, disabling. You will never regain that true function that a human hand can, can uh, accomplish. So we've created something that kind of looks like this ugly creature. Um, I think it's beautiful, but it's not a jellyfish at all. It's a engineered nervous tissue, a nervous tissue construct that is almost like developing a mini nervous system in culture. So a mini nervous system is really what your nervous system wants. It likes the wet stuff. It likes the neurons. It will embrace them like old friends, old relatives. 
Right now, as I'm speaking to you, the little nerve fibers, dendrites, and axons are finding new targets, and they're welcome no matter where they go. If I transplant a neuron in your brain, very likelihood it will survive and be um, embraced as a new friend and neighbor. But as far as the nervous system taking on electrodes, even flexible ones, this is foreign. It wants to fibrose over, scar over. Maybe it wants to reject it. Maybe it wants to just die because it got pierced. So what we're looking at to develop this technology is something for you neuroscientists in the room, which I assume most people are, and most people have the understanding that you've learned in the first chapter that the cell body extends and acts on that large nerve uh, fiber. There's a growth cone that you know, limps along and finds a target. If it's an, if it's an embryo, that's about two millimeters away. And then there should be a synapse, and the next chapter is on receptors. But there's something that's been missing from the textbooks. And that is what happens after synaptogenesis or after integration of that axon. Something huge can happen. In fact, something maybe more, far more dramatic, maybe far more impressive than that first phase of growth. That's that second phase. It's implicit. We see it everywhere around us. I mean, how does a giraffe have axons or a blue whale have tens of meters, 30 meters of axon? You know, he had a, a, a neuron in the brainstem that connected to a motor neuron in the tail. Again, about two millimeters away, but the animal grew 30 meters. Those were mechanical forces that, that caused that growth. So those mechanical forces, like the growth of vertebrae, will add material, and the axon, there's a mismatch between the tissue properties. This, the tissue stiffness of the axons in a spinal cord are not that great. So they can either go along for the ride or get stretched down like a rubber band until they snap, but they don't. The blue whale does great. So this kind of ignored uh, area of neuroscience, this really important area, uh, has been ignored but can be exploited, I think, for repair of the nervous system. So the idea is just to copy that. We, we've built a lot of really weird gizmos where we have a box. We can grow two populations of neurons next to each other on a top membrane and a bottom membrane and use a microstepper motor system to separate them after that first phase of growth has occurred and axons span those two populations. So basically, just as a, a top membrane, bottom membrane, there's <coughs> integration between, and we just turn on a box that stretches further and further, and these axons that span those two populations don't thin down. In fact, they grow thicker in diameter than if we did not stretch them. This is a natural process. Uh, and they organize themselves in very large bundles, otherwise called fascicles. So the growth is impressive. It goes on and on and on. We've gone uh, a centimeter a day. We could probably go more. We've gone uh, 10 centimeters in length. We could go probably, probably across the room. The blue whale obviously can do quite a bit. Um, and what we see is that it, these axons will organize themselves into larger and larger bundles, coalescing into these large fascicles. And, and over time, you end up with something that is more and more organized, which I think recapitulates ontogeny, recapitulates what happens during development. You might have somewhat random trajectories of axons spanning two populations of neurons, but over time it becomes highly organized into tracks or nerves. In our case, we see it, something that looks almost like harp strings or beanstalks that can, can occur over time. And this can be done with almost any type of neuron. Motor neurons, sensory neurons, human animal, doesn't matter. Every neuron seems to have this capacity for this enormous, we call it extreme stretch growth that can grow beyond the dogma. I don't know if anybody studies neurofilament protein transport here, but that should be limited to you know, millimeters a day. Uh, fast transport can barely keep up to the pace that we're looking at here. The blue whale exceeds everything. So this is, this, all this type of growth goes against the dogma that we've all been taught in textbooks. But despite that growth, things can maintain function. We can stimulate one end, record from the other of this construct. So we've uh, been very successful, I think. We can grow things uh, really fast, really long, uh, maintain their geometry and, and function. And yes, we have the world record. Uh, we're, we're kind of the only ones in the race, so that doesn't count. Uh, and we may not actually be the first people to think of something along these lines, as, you know, as we heard on <laughs> different. Uh, it's just so strange that people don't want to do all kinds of things like this, but not necessarily with the same goals. 
Uh, for us, we want to transplant this material. Now, it's, it's, kind of a, it's nice to be able to do this in culture, but it has to come out of culture. You've created a, we've created a three-dimensional geometry, very organized geometry. And I, I don't know how well you can see this. See these kind of lines right here? Those are axons. There are about a million axons there in kind of this planar structure. Well, we can embed a hydrogel like collagen or whatever and lay it down. It, it uh, links up, and then we can peel it out, kind of like using the silly putty on the comics, you know? And we can take this out of the culture environment, and if you've ever had a fruit roll up, we can then roll that up and put it into a tube, um, thereby creating an entire construct. Now, we've used this to repair spinal cord injury, which I'm not going to discuss today. We've actually used it to repair the brain, uh, various brain lesions. Um, but I will briefly discuss uh, peripheral nerve repair, where picture a deficit, a lack of a nerve between a large gap and a nerve. And when you cut the axons on the you know, proximal side, they're completely gone downstream. So you have two stumps, but the distal stump has no axons in it, and therefore you get no innervation to your limb. But when we transplant this, we can go up multiple centimeters of a transplant. If we put just a tube between the two nerve stumps, axons from the host would never go centimeters across that tube. That will never happen. But when we put the construct in and wait several months, we end up with something that looks on the outside exactly like the nerve that used to be there, but that was a gap at least five centimeters long, and now there's a complete nerve on the outside. When we look in the inside, we still see the cells we transplanted here, these, these large round bodies. Uh, you don't have neurons in your peripheral nervous system. This is what we transplanted there. The green are the transplant axons, but down here on a larger scale, we see red coming in. Those are the host axons coming in, and the host axons love the graft axons. They love them so much that they intertwine with them. They know what they are. This is what they do. They will follow those other axons to the complete, very distant end of that, that transplant region because they have something to follow. It's axon-induced axon growth and guidance. So the axons themselves provide the, perhaps some of the strongest signals to entice the host axons out across this huge gap to then re and restore function in that limb. And we've had um, really wonderful results in a large animal model. And we're hoping to go to clinical trials in a few years. And um, even over time, we see myelination. If you look at cross sections of these, the outside red is myelin, inside uh, red, uh, green is the axon. So this has been very exciting. Um, and we're very uh, pleased that we have something that might have a clinical uh, translation soon. But for the purpose of a brain machine interface, we think that this is also one uh, strategy that we should pursue. So think of it, rather than just bridging damage of a nerve, if the whole arm is cut off, the nerve stump is still at the stump of the arm. It still has all the axons in that stump. So if we can cobble together the same way we, we just did, at least on that end, with uh, repairing the nerve, but on the other end have a multi-electrode array that might be able to uh, interface with the device. So think of it where we can actually in, well, uh, your nervous system doesn't like to be poked and jammed with some kind of electrodes. It doesn't know what to do with it. If we grow neurons selectively, decorate these delicious chemicals on the electrode array, the neurons will adhere very tightly and, and will survive there and stay there, maintaining their geometry post-transplant. Uh, so in one iteration, we use this uh, array where we have, this is the outside that can be attached to the device. Over here are the tips where we have all the electrodes shown here. We can see the cells on these electrodes and then put them in what we call the axon elongation device. Uh, these are the shanks you can see, they're the darks and that go on. These are the axons, these long striations that go all the way across to the other populations of neurons. So this would be the end that we would transplant to a nerve stump uh, and that these axons would extend out to these shanks. And notice that there's a preferential growth of the axons at the tips of the shanks. I mean, we didn't even expect that. That's really, that was a definite bonus. Again. The shanks are where the neurons are, and you can see the, all these green axons going out that will travel whatever distance we need to separate the uh, device from the nervous system. Uh, we can use uh, fancy techniques to use uh, light channel rhodopsin, in this case, to use light to stimulate one end and use the multi-electrode array to um, record from the other. And we have a million axons, so we can have, uh, this is a, a smaller array, each box, 
is an electrode, but we can stimulate some with light and just see the response at different regions spatially. But this could go up geometrically, the number of responses you need. To pick up that dime with your fingers, you are getting that two-way communication. You're feeling the edge, you know where it is, you pick it up, somebody throws a ball, you catch it. We need that kind of, that incredible depth of, of information. And what this also allows us to do is that two-way communication. So it's kind of like, can ping pong back and forth. Stimulation can be made at the multi-electrode array, travel down the axons to the body. Body can send a signal that could drive a motoric kind of signal to drive a device. And again, that two-way communication is the only way we're ever going to be able to button a shirt or do simple tasks. So again, the same iteration as you see in the peripheral nerve repair. The difference is at one end, there's not a nerve. It's just where the arm stump might be, where we have the multi-electrode array and the connector that can go to a device. Uh, we have the neurons and the long axon tracks in the middle that are then cobbled to the host nerve stump. The nerve stump then can will send out regenerating host axons that will intertwine and follow the graft axons because that's what they do. This is kind of a backdoor approach, kind of a trick to rather than worry about shoving an electrode into the host, you're enticing it to come right out and join the electrode directly. And that's what we see. So when we transplant, again, the green is the graft and the red are these axons coming out right to the electrodes. They've been drawn, kind of the siren song from the, the graft axons are bringing them right to where we want them to be. So what we can see is that um, you think of an iteration where the, whether you want a hand transplant or full arm limb uh, for a prosthetic, these red lines are nerves kind of blown up over here that um, over here there's the elongation of the axons and the neuron bodies at each end. So you can picture that this wet human nerve is sending out the wet axons that will grow across the wet interface. That's what they want to interact with. And then in the laboratory, we have, in this case, depth electrodes where those axons can then be, to, uh, can then be brought out to various regions of these electrodes for uh, any number of connections to drive very, very, very complex devices. So this is what I'm, I'm talking about for the uh, Luke Skywalker. So I, I would like to think that spot right there was really where his fibers, these red fibers, could go across, reach across the, the shanks till they finally are brought right up to the electrodes. Now, I've been a little remiss. I didn't put in the slide with all the, the t huge team of people who have uh, worked on this, so I'll just take the credit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very fascinating talk. Uh, I was curious about the peripheral nerve uh, system when it regenerates can have a lot of improper matching with motor and sensory nerves. I was wondering if you looked at some of the functional connectivity uh, in animal models with your graphs. Yeah, so think about it this way. So people have lost hands completely and you put the hand back on, their own hands. Sometimes if people had you know transplant from an organ donor even. There is no way those axons are going to back out to the same muscle units and yet they go in a very diverse direction, but through remapping, it's amazing that the motor system can remap so quickly in your brain that they can quickly learn to regain function of the hand. Sensory does not remap quite as well. And the, the really issue for any kind of transplant like this is a thought about pain where a sensory fiber might join to, let's say, a muscle unit. But surprisingly, it seems to make sense. It's definitely not going back to the original place but it's going to a place that, by and large, does make sense. Uh, well, I had a very similar question. What, uh, so it was about uh, people that had a spinal cord uh, injury. So if you can like, just put this in, in between the two severe uh, ends, and then you know, how they can uh, kind of function. And uh, the other one was, uh, with this thing of the elongation of the of the axon, uh, you said that they get thicker, and mm -hmm. presumably they also <clears throat> the the time it takes for a signal to travel through them gets uh, shorter. I mean, like if you get a thicker axon, you know, it travels mm -hmm. faster. So, are you measuring that? You know, like 
I can even think that perhaps that's like sort of observed or compensated for. Yeah, so we have, so some of the biophysics, let's say sodium channel biophysics, they do have higher sodium channels, much like children have more sodium channels on their axons because of constant remodeling of the brain and, and whatnot. So they do, but their conduction velocity is the same as you might predict for whether it's myelinated or unmyelinated, but the, the thickness can have an effect. Um, for the spinal cord repair, uh, there are two ways to look at it. The first way is the most likely. If we use um, nerves of uh, peripheral origin and create these constructs, they look like the kind of, uh, you might know of the Aguayo experiments, they put a peripheral nerve in. But in this case, we can entice motor fibers to come across what really is a, a vast cyst, which often forms a spinal cord injury, and follow these constructs all the way down to the other side. And uh, in one case, we've seen that they have formed a, a new interspinal circuitry. So uh, the other more elegant, or more, um, I guess, more uh, exotic type of uh, thing is that these constructs can act like a relay themselves so that the host might synapse on one end and now the signal can be propagated through the construct itself. So. Hi, thanks for your talk. This, this is kind of a wild question, um, but, but you could envision having supernumerary limbs, right? You could envision having multiple different, like five, seven, eight hands. So, so just thinking at that level, if you want to increase function, is what's the limit on the system that you're working with um, and, and the remapping that can occur in the, the cortex to That's a great question. I think that. that, I think that especially the young people here, your grandkids are going to ask you, say, uh, so uh, did you have to use a keyboard? You know, <laughs> so I, I think, that, I think forget, forget limbs, I think there's going to be just everything. Can you imagine just changing channels or whatever? I mean, this is going to be, uh, you know, driving vehicles. Right now, the DOT, DOD is very interested in this rather than take all the time with that toggle switch that you just think this. So it's not just simply limbs. I mean, the sky is the limit. So limit. There is nothing that what we do with our hands to manipulate the environment that couldn't be done even just perhaps in our minds. Uh, just before we all head out, I'd like to uh, take a brief moment to say a few words of thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers here for uh, their time and their effort to be here with us. So you can give them a round of applause. For them. I'd like to thank the uh, Mahoney Institute of Neurological Sciences and the Biomedical Graduate Student Association for their uh, generosity in supporting this event tonight. I'd like to thank uh, John Danny, Josh Gold, Jane Hoshi, Jackie Fultz, and Kelly Joyne Shudo for their invaluable administrative assistance with this. Uh, I'd like to thank the Public Lecture Planning Committee for organizing the event uh, with an especial, a special shout out to uh, Dave Reiner. Dave, without you, I don't think we could have made this night happen. So. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank you all for braving the cold weather to come out and be here with us tonight. We have uh, a reception just outside. We encourage you to stay for the food and hopefully sparkling conversation that follows. So thank you very much for coming. Have a great night.